Okay. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I would like to welcome you to this month's Kelsey Museum Virtual Flash Talk, Investigating Color in Roman Egypt. Today's presentation will last about 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our audience. Conservator Carrie Roberts will present her key findings from the Kelsey's Conservation Department's NEH-funded survey of colorful artifacts at the museum. Carrie will talk about the techniques used to investigate pigments and dyes found in the Kelsey's unparalleled Roman Egyptian collection, which includes a range of materials from painted stone, ceramic, and wood to, tie, to dyed textiles. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Stephanie. Can everyone hear me okay? I see heads nodding. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully I'll share the right screen. This is that, can everyone see three limestone funerary markers with color on them? Excellent. Wonderful. Okay, well, so thank you again. And I appreciate, I appreciate you all being here today for this talk. Um, like Stephanie said, my name's Carrie and I am a conservator here at the Kelsey Museum along with Suzanne Davis. Suzanne and I are responsible for the care and preservation of the collection here at the Kelsey and on our various Kelsey sponsored field projects. And Suzanne and I also conduct technical or scientific research on objects in the collection. One area of research that we're currently active in is color. We're studying ancient pigments and dyes on objects from a scientific perspective. The questions we're trying to answer with this research are what pigments were used on these objects, um, how were they used, and finally, and this is, we're just at the beginning of this question, um, what can this tell us about the ancient world more broadly? So for today's talk, I'm going to share some updates from the NEH funded color research project Suzanne and I have been working on in the conservation lab over the past two years. And I will give you some background on this project, talk about some of our overall goals and research methods. And then finally, I'm gonna share a few of the exciting discoveries that we've made about the collection along the way. And I apologize, there is a humidifier running behind me that makes funny sounds. So hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> so first, um, a bit of background. Our, our interest in the materials and technology of ancient pigments and dyes goes back a number of years. I hope that some of you here had a chance to visit the Kelsey back in 2019 when Kathy Person and I co-curated Ancient Color. Um, ancient Color is a special exhibition that focused on color in the Roman world. And the exhibition covered three themes. Um, first, making color, how pigments and dyes were sourced and made. Uh, second, using color, um, which focused on the meanings uh, and use of specific colors in Roman, in Roman art. And then finally, investigating color. Um, in this section, I carried out a couple of in-depth technical studies on two Roman artifacts from the collection. One of these investigations focused on this portrait of a woman from the Fayum region of Egypt. With the help of conservation scientist Christina Basilka at the Detroit Institute of Arts, we were able to identify a range of pigments that were used to paint this woman's portrait, including Egyptian blue, I don't know if you can see my cursor, hopefully, uh, rose matter, which comes from a plant root, cinnabar, green earth, and indigo. These are pigments that have known source locations throughout, or had known source locations throughout the Roman Empire, and were the product of exchanges in material goods and pigment technology. So much could be learned from studying this single object. It made me wonder, what could we learn from studying the Kelsey's Roman collection as a whole? So Suzanne and I submitted a proposal to NEH to study pigments and dyes in our collection. And the goals of this project have been to continue the scientific investigation of color here at the museum, but on a larger, a much larger scale. Um, another goal is to focus on Roman Egypt. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that we know less about color use in Egypt during this period than we do about um, 
pigment and dye use in pharaonic Egypt. So we felt like this research would be a valuable contribution to the, the research literature. Um, the other reason is that our Roman Egyptian collections here at the Kelsey are unusually well documented. Um, and this allows us to draw connections between what we're learning about, about color um, and known sites, people and places. And that's, that's unusual for museum research. Um, another goal we had was to use tools that are accessible to um, our research audience. So non-invasive tools like um, um, digital microscopy, multispectral imaging, and XRF. These are techniques that are often already known to the researchers we wanted to engage with, such as archaeologists and our historians. And finally, uh, the big product that we are developing as part of this project is an online toolkit. Um, uh, it's going to be a website um, that will allow researchers to uh, use some of these techniques themselves in studying their own collections. So as many of you know, um, <laughs> as many of you know, the Kelsey preserves a huge collection of material from Roman Egypt, much of which comes from two specific excavations that were overseen by U of M back in the 20s and 30s, Quranus and Terranuthis. The materials that were discovered at these sites have helped us better understand what daily life was like for people living in this part of the Roman world and what they believed about death and the afterlife. Our technical survey would focus mainly on objects from these collections. We've had three primary technical research tools at our disposal. The first being microscopy, both binocular microscopy and handheld digital. Microscopy um, is an essential tool for examining artifact surfaces under high magnification. And handheld digital microscopes, such as the one shown here, are especially um, relatively affordable um, and can be tethered to a computer for live view surface examination at a really high scale. So they're ideal for looking for tiny traces of pigment on, say, marble sculpture, or in this case, on the surface of a terracotta figurine from Karanis. Another tool that we've used is called multispectral imaging. Um, multispectral imaging is actually a photographic technique in which a specific light source is directed onto an artifact paint surface. The light source may be in the visible range, but it can also be in the ultraviolet and infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Pigments and dyes absorb, reflect, and emit light in characteristic ways that can be captured in an image. This is done with the help of a modified camera. Um, we use a DSLR camera whose infrared filter has been taken out. And we also use lens filters um, that allow the camera to capture responses um, from the object at specific white light wavelengths. So the, the diagram shown here represents visible induced infrared luminescence imaging, or VIL for short, because it's way too, it takes too long to say that. Um, and, and with this technique, visible light is directed on the object, with infrared luminescence is captured by the camera. The infrared luminescence captured on this statuette of Nephthys um, shows us where on this object Egyptian blue pigment was used. And we know this because Egyptian blue is the only pigment in use in ancient Egypt that emits infrared light at 960 nanometers. So really everywhere, that you see bright white in this image is where Egyptian blue was used. Another multispectral imaging technique involves um, shining ultraviolet light on an object in order to detect rose matter dye or pigment. Um, if you look at the image on the right, you can see the objects in the figure's hands are glowing a characteristic orange pink color that is again characteristic of um, uh, this uh, organic red plant-based dye that could also be used as a pigment, rose matter. In addition to multispectral imaging, we're also using a handheld X-ray fluorescence spectrometer to identify the chemical elements present in paint surfaces. And much of our NEH grant award went toward the purchase of this spectrometer, uh, the Bruker Tracer 5G uh, that's been calibrated specifically for pigment analysis. 
X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy as a technique uses X-rays to identify chemical elements present on the surface of an object. The instrument shoots an X-ray beam onto the painted object, which like everything is made, made up of atoms. Uh, the atoms electrons are excited by this X-ray beam and get moved around as a result, producing new X-rays. And these X-rays are detected by the XRF instrument which produces a spectrum or line graph um, that represents the different chemical elements present in a paint area. So here we've got peaks for calcium, um, that's their sulfur and then iron. And we were looking at a red painted area when we developed the spectrum and that was an indicator to us that a, a, red, a red earth pigment or a red iron oxide or ochre was used. So those are the research tools we've been using. And now I'm gonna talk for the remainder of my talk about some of the discuss discoveries we've been able to make um, over the course of this project. These are just some highlights. Um, the first is one of nearly 50 textiles that Suzanne Davis studied um, from Karanas as part of this project. Um, the one I'm showing here is just really cute <laughs> and, and it's interesting too. Um, it's a tapestry woven textile fragment with an animal motif. I have in my notes here the word octopus. I actually have no idea what this animal is. <laughs> but if anyone has any ideas, please chime in. Um, in any case, that's neither here nor there. What's interesting about this textile is, is the dye colors. Um, the multispectral images that Suzanne captured um, here suggested that both the pink, so the outline color, and the purple, the animal itself, um, uh, both the pink and purple yarns are in fact a combination of two distinct textile dyes, matter, so that plant-based red I talked about before, and indigo, a, a blue plant-based dye. When Suzanne examined the textile under a binocular microscope, she discovered exactly how the dyes were combined by spinning together pink and blue dyed wools to create pink and purple colored yarns. So here's a pink area and here's a bit of the purple. And you can see the individually colored wool fibers that have been spun together to create these distinct colors. And it appears that the pinks and purples were done this way on all of the textiles Suzanne looked at, um, which is significant because when we think of purple dye, in the Roman world, we often think of shellfish purple, Tyrian purple, um, another naturally occurring dye that came from the bronchial gland of a, of a snail, Mediterranean snail. Um, that particular dye was so expensive to produce, very few people could actually afford to wear it. Um, and in this case, the textile maker was using an alternative approach, combining you know, red and blue um, dyes that were more readily available to create this particular color purple. We made another interesting discovery on this terracotta dog figurine. Now this figurine was featured in Terry Wilfong's jackal themed exhibition, Death Dogs back in 2015. I don't know if you, any of you remember, remember that. That was such a, that was such a fun show. Um, but anyway, it's also a very popular um, object among us Kelsey staff, but we didn't fully understand the extent to which this dog was painted until Laurel Fricker looked at it under a binoc, uh, sorry, it was actually a digital, digital microscope. Um, Laurel, by the way, um, work, is working with us as a, an assistant researcher on the project. Um, and she's a, 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 a student in the IFCA program. And I see her like that, okay, Laurel. Anyway, um, so when Laurel looked at this object under magnification, she could see traces of red, pink, and purple paint over a white ground layer. And this is the coolest thing I think about this dog. Look here, you can see the transition between a zone of yellow and a zone of pink on the belly of the dog. It happens right about here. Now, there are only small amounts of paint left on the dog, but there is enough interspersed over the dog's body for us to start visualizing its original paint scheme. Um, Eric Campbell, who's the Kelsey's graphic designer and is working with us on the color website, is also working on creating a digital color reconstruction of the dog. Um, I'm so excited to see it. For now, though, I'm sharing my rather sketchy sketch of the dog <laughs> on the left. 
um, just to give you an idea of how, how this might come together. And this reconstruction will be featured on the color website. Our technical survey also revealed something unexpected in this painted wood panel. Um, the pigments we found were interesting um, and they included the only confirmed use of the um, yellow pigment orpiment on any of the objects we've looked at as part of this survey. Um, as some of you may know, orpiment was a toxic um, um, uh, um, arsenic sulfide pigment that was used in the Roman world, and it was incredibly bright yellow. Um, and that's where its name comes from. I think it's golden color, golden pigment. Um, anyway, so it was used here in this, in this kind of medallion area. But something else also appeared while we were imaging the panel that we did not expect to see. The object was originally cataloged as a fragmentary portrait of a woman. And at first glance, the painting sort of looks like it could depict hair. But when we looked at the panel under infrared light, it became clear that that is not what we're seeing. There's actually a body here and maybe a neck and legs. And if you look, the legs have talons. So this is a bird of some kind. Um, if you look even more closely, you can sort of see this kind of curved shape that we, we think is it could be a wreath. Um, and because it's a wreath, we're sort of thinking this could be an eagle because you see the two together quite frequently. Um, and when you see those two things together, an eagle with a wreath, there's a strong association with Roman military culture. And that's kind of what we're thinking could be going on here. Um, and like many objects um, from Quranis, we know precisely where this panel was found and what was found with it. Um, and as you can see, this, these finds provide pretty compelling evidence that this panel was used in a house. Um, could this possibly have been the home of um, a military officer, a retired military officer? Um, it, it may be a stretch, but um, find, you know, finding this object in a house raises questions about who might have lived there. Um, so that was really exciting and unexpected. Now, the last object I'm going to talk about is this rather unassuming wall painting fragment that was once part of the decorated wall of a room. Its infrared false color image, this image with the red background, um, shows characteristic colors seen with uh, red earths and green earths. So um, earth pigments, um, this yellow color and this blue color are kind of the indicators of that. So that's what we thought we were looking at initially. But then we examined the um, object under XRF and something unusual popped up in the green dots. The element chromium, chromium is an element most often linked with modern green pigments, such as chrome green and chromium oxide green. And neither of these pigments were available in antiquity. In fact, they didn't come into use until the 19th century. So this, of course, raised some red flags with us about the object itself. Um, but this wall painting's um, provenience is pretty airtight. It was found in an excavated room in a house at Karanis, along with other documented finds, and a number of which again suggest domestic activity. And if you look at it in its 1935 division album photograph, it's upside down and in black and white, but it is completely unchanged um, between then and now. So that makes it unlikely that um, something was done to it, like a restoration treatment, um, the addition of new, um, you know, touch, touching in um, restoration treatment with modern paint. That, that's very unlikely to have happened, um, um, which could have explained why the chromium is there. Um, so how do we actually explain the presence of this element in the green dots? Well, after doing some research, I learned that chromium can actually appear in naturally occurring green earth deposits. And chromium has been seen in green earth um, painted on objects from different parts of the ancient Mediterranean. Now this has opened, opened up a whole new set of questions for me. 
why are we seeing chromium containing green earths on artifacts in Egypt, but also Italy? A colleague of mine found it in a Roman wall painting from mainland Italy. That's interesting. Um, are there specific geographic sources for chromium rich green earth in the Mediterranean? Or do you see it everywhere? But if there are specific geographic sources that could tell us something about where the pigment came from, and uh, what could this trace element tell us about where Egyptian painters were sourcing their pigments um, in the Mediterranean, if, if there? So I would love to explore this question further because scientists have successfully linked pigments on objects with ancient source locations before. And an example I love to share over and over again <laughs> is um, this wonderful red shroud mummy of Heraclides. Um, uh, Maurice Faboda and Mark Walton did a study, um, and Karen Trentleman too, back in, um, I think 2007, 2009, where they sampled the red lead pigment that was used to color the background of the shroud. And they were able to source it back to Rio Tinto, Spain. Um, there were um, silver mines in that area that produced lead byproducts. And one of those lead byproducts, it turns out, was probably red lead that was then shipped to different locations in the, in the Mediterranean. And the people making this shroud um, obviously wanted that specific pigment for color quality and the fact that red lead was an insecticide and might have protected the body from insect activity. So we can learn a lot just for color on objects. Um, and th that's the sort of thing that I would like to delve into more as we continue next phases of this color research project here at the Kelsey. So we've learned a lot about color in the collection through this project, through our technical survey. And we're looking forward to diving deeper into some of these questions in the future. And we'll be sure to share those as, as, as we learn them. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I would like to open up the floor to our audience. Um, if you have any questions for Carrie, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask them, or you can throw your question in the chat and I can read it aloud for her. Uh, yeah, Carrie, this is Anne. I've got a question. I was wondering about the uh, survival of existing color on objects. Uh, we see so many more examples from uh, Egypt, it seems, than from other places, though, you know, Roman wall paintings, especially from Pompeii and everything, it's still very colorful. Does it, is there an, an environmental reason for that? In that a lot of the uh, Rome, a lot of the Egyptian uh, articles are much older than some of the Roman ones, or just uh, the fact that it's more protected if you're in a house uh, that's covered with volcanic ash, or you're in a tomb in Egypt. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with with the environment that the fragments were found in. So in, in Roman Egypt. Um, you have a very relatively, um, at least in antiquity, temperate climate. And then many of the artifacts that have been studied come from tombs, it's true. So with no light and um, relatively stable climate temperature in our age, so that helps. Um, and I think with a lot of the Roman mainland Italy material, there's like a selective preservation coming from sites where um, spaces were buried. Um, by exactly volcanic ash and that sort of thing. So that we're seeing amazing um, wall paintings from Herculaneum, um, Aplantis, sites like that. But then you get lucky sometimes, like there are sites where just the burial conditions were just right. And when that happens, you can find amazing color preservation. I saw probably the most incredible wall painting preserved actually not in Egypt, but in, um, uh, a town on the Amalfi coast um, in Italy where it it's as if someone had just put a blanket over it 2000 years later, it completely unchanged. So, um, you know, climate, love, yeah. 
Thanks. Hi, this is Annalise Moser. I had a question about the cost of painting. Um, I'm familiar, for example, with the toy horses from Karanis, and they seem to be decorated in primarily black and red. Are those locally sourced or would there be a greater cost? What can we know about the economic level of Karanis from the use of color? I think looking at the materials we're finding um, broadly across the Karanis collection that a lot of it was probably locally sourced and readily available. So reds and blacks were most like almost exclusively in the study at least uh, red red earths, which were probably locally available, um, though certainly available in other parts of the Mediterranean. And then blacks were almost exclusively um, made from burned organic material, like plant material that had been burned or bone that had been burned. So um, there's definitely an economy to color. And we're finding over and over again, um, you know, accessible colors um, being used at Karanis. The orpiment is interesting though, because that came from specific source locations that may not have been in Egypt. So it could suggest something. We also found lead whites on the Terranusa steely, which again, um, are a type of pigment that you could do an isotopic study on to figure out whether it was something um, produced locally or brought in from elsewhere. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Thank you, it, it does, thank you. Um, I see a question from Julia. Oh, and from Zachary Quinn. Um, so I will get to Zachary's first. Um, unique challenges when working with textiles. Unfortunately, Zachary, I do not have um, as much knowledge of textile production as Suzanne does. If she were here, she's in Sudan right now, so she can't <laughs> answer your question. But um, she is looking both at dye use and at uh, textile structures um, it, at use um, being used at Karanis. So Suzanne is really the person to talk to more about that if you are curious. Um, and Julia, it's, let's see, um, threads of, yes. Um, it looks like this was done more than once at Karanis. Um, again, Suzanne would be better able to answer your question in terms of how, you know, how common. Um, I think there were, there were other ways to do this. If you could take a yarn and double dye the yarn with one dye than the other, but in this, on that particular object, it was two wools spun together. Um, but again, Suzanne, Suzanne's the one to figure that out, not me. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, I guess if there are no further questions, um, we will go ahead and conclude our flash talk today. Um, a big thank you to Carrie Roberts for her very interesting talk and also to our audience for attending today. Um, you can find out about future flash talks at the Kelsey Museum on our website. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie.